will get started. Uh, this is the Aztec Proving Ecosystem Community Call. Uh, it's the first one. Uh, everyone should know me on the call. My name's Cooper. I'm currently focused on product and kind of some strategy stuff as well, whatever uh, that means in, in our industry. Um, and yeah, why are we here? Um, I mean, we're obviously here because we love Ethereum. Like, none of us would be wasting our time if we didn't love Ethereum. Um, that's like everything in this whole industry, and at least what Aztec does is predicated on this like innate belief in, in Ethereum. Um, we're here because we want to ensure consistent, kind of fair, neutral information distribution about Aztec. Uh, I feel like a lot of projects out there gatekeep their roadmap or you know gatekeep what they're doing next or who they're working with or all these things. Um, and I think that we have an opportunity to do better. Um, picking winners isn't fun, whether you want to do it or not. And losing because like you weren't the first to get a grant isn't fun or something like that, right? No one really wants to play these games. Um, and yeah, we want to kind of uphold the credible neutrality we want to see uh, in the world. Um, yeah, try to prevent redundancy and wasted efforts in the community. Um, we don't want everyone to go out and try to implement, you know, various flavors of the same things, of the same software, of the same tooling, of the same developer stack. Um, so, you know, ways that we can try to prevent that, I think, uh, as proactively as possible will be, you know, very valuable for everyone. Um, and yeah, push ZK into the future. Um, at the end of the day, you know, we're here talking about Aztec in ways that you can prove specific things for Aztec, but what we're talking about isn't just valuable for us, uh, and it will help move kind of the broader ZK space forward, in our opinion. Um, and yeah, build the future of on-chain privacy. Uh, that's what Aztec's here to do. Um, goals for these calls specifically, uh, share updates about the Aztec roadmap when we have them, uh, get to know everyone, get to know everyone on the call. It's a very small industry. I'm sure many of you know each other already. Um, and give a platform for like the proving ecosystem. And what I mean by that is like anyone interested in generating relevant zero knowledge proofs, uh, whether they're for Aztec, whether they're for Noir, whether they're for kind of any of these on-chain privacy protocols. Um, you know, discuss specifications, roadmap items, ways to work together. It'll be a kind of open forum. And if people want to propose things to put into the, the agenda to talk about on these calls, they can definitely do so. Uh, if you're like, you know, I'm talking about this specific way that we can have some updated ZK tooling and it has nothing to do with Aztec, uh, we were happy to have this be, you know, a place for you to talk about them. Uh, again, trying to prevent redundancy, wasted effort, and maybe those tools might not be relevant to us today, but maybe they will be in the future. Um, and yeah, showcase the work being done, demo, demos, presentations, uh, kind of you know marketing launchpad. Um, on the call, we have everyone from very early stage seed startups to you know multi billion dollar projects. Um, and uh, I think providing you know an opportunity for people to have a shared platform is is going to be really valuable and kind of that level playing field that I talked about earlier. Um, intros just from the Aztec Labs team. Obviously, not all these people are here today. Um, we actually have some other people are, that are here today. So this slide just isn't accurate, but it is maybe a reflection of like your major points of contact uh, at Aztec at the moment. Uh, so you have Joe Andrews, co-founder and president. Uh, you have myself and Raul on the product team. Uh, you have Santiago, who is leading a lot of the uh, kind of execution layer or consensus layer engineering. Uh, you have Lasse, who's leading a lot of the smart contracts engineering. Uh, and you have Steve, who's uh, leading partnerships. Uh, you actually also have Lisa Boonin on the call as well, who's our chief commercial officer or chief operating officer. Um, and probably a few other people from Aztec on the call as well. Um, in the shared Telegram chat, you also have the entirety of our developer relations team. So at any point in time, you know, you have, I think there's eight or 10 people from the Aztec Labs team in that shared channel. Uh, and you should feel free to use them as, you know, resources or extensions of your team, whether or not they have to do with Prover Boost or otherwise. Um, uh, we do have uh, attendees and representatives from all of these teams. Um, if we could maybe just go really, really quickly uh, and maybe like one person from each team just call out who's on the actual call and who's the representative or like maybe try to contextualize who's on it for like engineering versus like, you know, partnership or BD or whatnot. And maybe if we could just go through the list really quickly in order, that would be sweet. So if we could start with Timu maybe at Gavilot. 
Uh, yes. Hello. Uh, demo from Gavila. We also have Thomas, our I'm the CEO. Thomas is our CTO, and then Nilu is uh, one of our protocol researchers. Um, yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mina next. Hey, uh, Phil from O1 Labs here, uh, head of BizDev based in New York. Um, and I would normally be on with a colleague from uh, from O1, also from the product side, um, but they can't make it today, so I'll be I'll be contributing. Great to see everybody. Yeah, we appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, Nil, you want to go next? Hey, everyone. Uh, Avi Zerlo here. I'm a chief product officer at Nil Foundation, uh, usually based in New York City. Thank you. Uh, Tirali? Hey, I'm Jake Lynn from Tirali, and uh, Chantel, I believe, is on the call, too. We'll see uh, Francesco, our CEO, couldn't make it, but uh, we, we're all there, so. Sweet. Uh, Prover Network? Hey, Vanishu here, founder and CEO. Uh, it's just me on the call today. Thanks for the call. Yeah, thanks for coming. Uh, we have someone from Marlin, I believe. Hello, everyone. Hi, uh, I'm Ashley. I lead product at Marlin. We have Roshan and Siddharth on the call. They are on the research team. Awesome. And I believe we have some folks from Strobe as well. Um, I don't know if they managed to make it to the call or if they're just in the Telegram chat. Um, cool. Well, this is everyone currently on the call. We've had a lot of interest from other parties, um, you know, you you probably know other people working on proving marketplaces potentially or other people working on kind of like centralized proving as a service uh the intention is to kind of grow this group over time uh but obviously i think that this is a, a really great place to start um i i don't know about you guys i'd say probably like 75 percent of the proving ecosystem projects or marketplaces are on this call so uh we sincerely you know appreciate you and in, in your interest in working with aztec um here's the agenda so we'll start off with a presentation from myself uh we'll have quick presentations from gebula and marlin uh, we'll also have question and answers for them and their team as well and then we'll open it up broadly for kind of discussions and q a for for everyone um cool any questions about the agenda before we get started sweet um, just a quick recap on design process, how we got there for anyone watching this or isn't super familiar. Um, so in May of last year, we originally did a sequencer RFP. So in our research forum, asking people to give us designs for how to do block production. Uh, October, we did one actually on, on proving um, the prover RFP. Uh, and we got a lot of really, really nice designs there. Um, in October, we also dropped the Aztec Sandbox, which is a local developer environment and effectively like a centralized single node uh, testnet. Um, in January, we, we did a, a kind of final RFC for, for Net and Sidecar as a combined protocol, so putting the block production and proving together. Um, and that's kind of when we decided to outsource roll-up proving specifically to third-party proving marketplaces. Um, and that's how we all got on the call today. Um, and yeah, today we have the first proving ecosystem call. Um, so this is kind of how we ended up here, or at least sequentially. So if anyone um, is curious, you know, all the research or docs and RFPs uh, on, on this slide are on our research forum, um, and, and feel free to do so. Uh, go re read them. Um, we're trying to do really good job at like historic or like preserving historical knowledge and like the decision tree we've gone through over time. Um, we think it's gonna be really important, you know, on a long enough time horizon to know why we actually made these decisions and, and why we ended up in this place on the trade-off space. Um, and so it's kind of important for us to preserve this as much as possible. Um, most people here are familiar with the Aztec designs, but again, just like the super, super TLDR, um, you know, sequencers can stake some tokens on layer one. Uh, there's a random leader election. Uh, it supports out of protocol PBS, so you have like an MEV boost like auction. Uh, item four here is probably the most interesting to folks on the call, which is an out of protocol proof auction uh, that we call prover boost that you can see in the diagram here. Um, proving happens after proving happens, you know, that gets verified on L1 and we kind of repeat the process. Um, specifically, the historical designs have prioritized safety over liveness and it's it's quite slow. Uh, these designs guarantee that you can never really get like nasty reorgs that impact your users and all these things, but it does mean that you only produce blocks as fast as you can produce proofs, uh, which has a variety of downsides. 
Um, you can see here in this diagram that you have, uh, you know, kind of like the highest ranked sequencer, uh, and they're going and outsourcing out of protocol, uh, the, you know, the rights to prove this block through a mechanism we call Prover Boost. Um, and you can see that we have, you know, Tirali and Nil and Gebulat and all these other proving marketplaces out here that can participate. Uh, the sequencer puts up the address, basically committing to one of these proving marketplaces. And one of these proving marketplaces actually puts up this economic deposit, which could potentially get slashed. Um, we can talk more about the specifics here, and it doesn't have to be the, the proving marketplace itself putting up the deposit. It's probably going to look similar to L1 PBS with like a relay infrastructure, so we can talk about that as well. Uh, but that's in spirit how it works, is the, the sequencer chooses an address. Uh, that address or someone ref, you know, representing that address puts up a deposit that could, could get slashed. Um, and so this is kind of the recap. Again, if you're not super familiar with this, the request for comments is uh, probably the best articulation of, of this design. And, and so this is our current internal focus, uh, making blocks go faster. You know, I mentioned on the last slide, you can only produce a block as fast as you can produce proofs. Proving is slow notoriously. It's getting faster with all the you know proving system iterations and whatnot. But our current internal focus, honestly, is making blocks go faster. Um, for anyone who re saw my recent talk at Research Day, this is a pretty similar slide, but option one is implementing a layer two consensus network. Um, you know, basically you can have your consensus network attest to the data to ensure that there are no transaction and proof withholding attacks, which means that you can actually confidently build ahead on blocks before they're actually proven, uh, which means you can kind of decouple your block proposing uh, times from your actual proving times, and then you can make blocks go faster because you know that uh, they won't get reorged. Um, you don't need it, but it is possible to get some really, really nasty reorgs in actually privacy protocols without having full kind of guarantees over the data being revealed uh, to generate your proofs. Uh, and this is probably the strongest option or guarantee that you can provide. Um, it may significantly increase networking requirements. Everyone has to gossip all these proofs. It's kind of an ungodly amount of data. Um, and I would actually say that a, a recent development in the past like two-ish weeks is that this is a path that we're currently pursuing and we're, we're pretty much pretty interested in. Um, uh, we think that it is probably the most viable way to trustlessly build ahead without reorgs. Um, there are a variety of other options on this slide that also can, you know, provide very good guarantees, uh, but these probably provide the best guarantees. Um, it is probably the most engineering work, so it's a, you know, a pretty well understood trade off there in terms of ideal solution versus like, you know, the amount of work we're willing to put into an MVP uh, type of thing. Um, but if, you know, we do end up pursuing this path, it would be very exciting. And um, this is one of the few paths that can actually get us faster than Ethereum block times. Uh, it could get us down to sub 12 second block times potentially. Um, there's also an option that we call private kernel proof aggregation, uh, which is a really long name. Someone should come up with like a marketing phrase for it that's better. But basically, like if we can pre-prove uh, all of the private parts of the transactions in Aztec um, and ensure that they can't revert, um, you would know that when you put up a block proposal in the state diff and like this partially pre-proven rollup, you would have enough data to know that this block won't reorg and you could uh, kind of confidently build ahead. Um, it's a lot of cryptography complexity. Um, we don't think that it's worth doing at the moment, but when people talk about like real-time proving in the context of Ethereum, uh, it actually kind of looks like this in a, a weird way. Um, so it, it is like an interesting idea um, and might be further out on the roadmap. Um, it's also not mutually exclusive with a layer two consensus network or otherwise. You could actually you know, have block proposals that pre-prove the private parts uh, and, you, and then your uh, consensus network could actually just validate those proofs rather than trying to like get all the data, simulate the transactions, validate that they could actually be valid and then you kind of attest to that. Um, uh, there's an option that we call Validium mode, which is kind of a silly name as well. We're really good at naming things, um, but it's basically just dumping a bunch of data on an Alt-DA layer and using that as a consensus network, basically. Uh, you would basically just guarantee that all the data necessary to uh, build ahead is on Celestia or whatever. Uh, and a sequencer uh, would just have better confidence that all of the data needed is on this Alt-DA layer uh, that they could actually download all that data acting as like a light client, 
and simulate the next block and be like, okay, do I trust you know the data that's on Celestia to build the head? Um, it doesn't actually fully prevent reorgs. Um, a malicious sequencer could just not publish data to Alt-DA or to the Validium. Um, and so it's not like a really strong or doesn't provide a, a significant amount of guarantees uh, to the network. Um, it just makes it very easy to identify potentially malicious actors, right? Like if you're an honest sequencer, you should put, publish all your stuff to, to this Validium or to Alt-DA. Um, and then we have what we would call like economic optimistic data availability, which is like requiring proposals to put up collateral or bonds that basically act as insurance. Uh, so it's like additional kind of capital or staking requirements that would get slashed in the event that you propose a block that doesn't end up proven in the chain. Um, huge amount of trade-offs, but this is actually our current focus. We're spending a lot of time right now debating our path forward here. Um, we would like to launch with significantly faster block times than uh, the current designs articulate. Um, and so this is um, where we're spending a lot of our efforts at the moment. Um, what does this mean for those on the call? Uh, why have I spent time talking about this? Um, the decision on the previous slide may significantly impact requirements, right? Like that's just kind of a fact. Um, do like, you know, an, an example is do we run an auction every three to six seconds or every 24 to 36 seconds, right? Like that's a very fundamentally different uh, amount of latency requirements and other sets of constraints. Um, another question is like, are provers working on a single batch per block or multiple batches per block? Are they proving batches that come from different proposers or do they have a, a single counterparty basically responsible for proof withholding attacks? Is like a relevant consideration. Um, and a large question in like making blocks go faster, right, is trying to consolidate or collapse a lot of the phases in the current Fernet protocol. And so the current question is, can the proposal reveal and prover commitment phases potentially be consolidated, uh, which does significantly change the way that prover boost would potentially be designed. So uh, hopefully this is insightful. Um, we aim to have a decision soon. I would say the estimated time is probably like two weeks plus some like feasibility analysis. Like we have to pick a path. Uh, within two weeks. Um, there's a good amount of consensus brewing internally, but uh, nothing definitive at the moment. Uh, once decisions have been made, um, someone on the team, probably like Lasse or Paula, will write a big recap slash update post um, articulating you know, the goals to make block production go faster, where we landed at on the trade-off space, et cetera. Um, and then I would say an ad hoc call um, for this group will be coordinated specifically to discuss any of those changes live. Uh, so specifically, like if the prover commitment phase and the proposal phase get collapsed, uh, we will have a call to discuss, you know, what that means for the people, you know, specifically on this call. Um, it might not have as much notice as other calls, so just kind of a heads up there. Um, and so hopefully this is insightful. This is our current focus and, you know, why we're not like kind of finalizing or pushing for these integrations just yet. We just you know, candidly don't want to waste anyone's time. Um, I'll talk a little bit about things that we can do and things that, you know, we're not telling anyone how to spend their time, but we just don't want to make sure we're not wasting your time. Um, and so hopefully that this is uh, insightful on, on how we're currently thinking about things. Um, the current expected releases for Aztec for folks to be aware. Uh, the next release will be an internal engineering kind of end-to-end -end testnet. Uh, it's on track to be completed in June to July of this year. Uh, literally like two to six weeks, give or take, depending on you know performance characteristics and other requirements to meet um, that definition. Um, we'll probably like. Yeah, it'll have like very naive sequencing, honestly. Um, it'll have like round robin proposals uh, from a permissionless set, and it'll have very basic proving. It'll have like a vertically integrated prover. It'll have like an AWS Terraform script or something like that, basically, for the sequencer to like stand up, you know, enough provers to generate its blocks. Um, but it will be end to end, it'll be very basic. Um, and there's nothing really actionable here for the ecosystem, but it is a big internal milestone. Um, it might be interesting to dig around the code, take a look. We could give a demo or like an end-to-end -end kind of walkthrough or like a code base, you know, review or something like that uh, tour, if that's of interest to people. Um, and it is a really big internal milestone. So we'll probably promote this publicly, blog about it, et cetera, talk about what we did, um, stuff like that. 
Um, after that, we're probably going to have some kind of like series of developer focused test nets, right? Um, estimated release in Q3. We're getting close to Q3. Um, there is not yet consensus on if we have this naive sequencing and basic proving test net, like a round robin and vertically integrated sequencing proving, if it makes sense to go ahead and release a developer focused test net. Um, in my opinion, it does. Uh, I don't think we need this, like all this fancy for net and sidecar and proving marketplace integrations to provide something valuable to our developer community. Um, and so it's possible that we ship, you know, the first developer uh, test net in early Q3 has naive sequencing and, you know, basic proving. Um, not fully, you know, no, no full consensus there. Um, a lot of the considerations around that is uh, the operational burden of managing the test net and knowing that it'll probably get, you know, botted, airdrop farmed, et cetera. So um, we're hesitant to try to, you know, introduce that potentially too early into the, the community. Um, yeah, there'll be, you know, a bunch of iterations of testnet with different goals, some with proving. Um, I would guess that the first two uh, releases for the developer-focused testnets don't have proofs integrated, uh, but I would guess that sometime in Q3, uh, probably towards the end of Q3, we do have uh, one that has, you know, proving integrated. Um, and then the feature complete testnet um, estimated release would be like Q4 or end of year. Um, obviously that has to have proving, right? This is feature complete. And so um, if you're thinking about when it would make sense to, you know, integrate with Aztec, uh, I would say like end of Q3 to beginning of, you know, mid, mid Q4 uh, with a plan to be fully integrated by the end of Q4, um, kind of just depending on your engineering roadmap requirements, how many people you can put on it, um, stuff like that, like how mature your tech stack is, whatnot. Um, but this is currently how we're thinking about it. Um, we will get more, you know, clarity and specificity here over time. Um, but when we talk to, you know, our own engineers and whatnot, this is uh, what we're telling them as well. So, um, cool. Uh, sidecar and prover boost. I acknowledge that it's already eight thirty, and we do have two presentations from uh, Gebulot and Marlin. So I will keep it moving. Uh, the inspiration for Sidecar and Prover Boost was like, we have a lot of shit to build. Uh, what's the simplest thing that could possibly work? Uh, that was me last year uh, thinking about how many complicated things we have on our engineering roadmap. Uh, and that led to Sidecar. Um, and then that actually led to an even simpler idea called for Net on the Rocks. Um, in a world where we consolidate the uh, proposal uh, reveal and prover commitment phase, I actually wouldn't be surprised if Renet on the Rocks makes a comeback into the world. Um, but it is uh, interesting, and that's kind of you know how we got here is the simplest thing we could possibly build. Um, the other inspiration was that it was kind of originally chosen to act as what we would call a minimum viable payload timeliness committee. So payload timeliness committees exist in like consensus protocol literatures and the Ethereum specifications. Um, specifically, a lot of the inclusion list designs include timeliness committees. Um, and it was kind of chosen to act as like an MVP PTC uh, in a weird way. Um, and so basically, the idea was like a proving marketplace wouldn't put up an economic bond to prove a block unless it had sufficient confidence that it had the data required to generate the proof. Um, and therefore, this could be like kind of an elegant solution to sequence or proof withholding attacks um, was, you know, kind of one of the original ideas uh, behind Sidecar. And so there's a variety of strategies in Aztec uh, for sequencers. And a sequencer who has secured block proposing rights can determine who pr proves their block. Um, and they have to choose one of these strategies by specifically opting into it via either, you know, the client that they're choosing to run or even, you know, updating that client's config. Um, and so they can choose to vertically integrate and prove their own blocks. This does limit the size of the blocks that you can propose by how much compute and proving capacity that you have. And so if you don't have a lot of compute, uh, you're not going to be able to propose a very large block. Therefore, you're not going to be able to make a lot of money because you can't extract a lot of MEV nor fees. Um, and so, you know, option one is really only viable if you are like a very large validator as a service or cloud provider or, you know, institutional staker. Um, option two would be to sell to a trusted service provider uh, and a trusted relationship with like, you know, kind of exclusive deal flow. Um, Coinbase could always sell their, pro their proving rights to someone. Um, and then the option three that we see is like selling permissionly, 
permissionlessly to the market. Uh, and we see prover boost as you know the mechanism or the the easy way to do so. Um, and the design goal for prover boost specifically, and it's not necessarily an easy one, is going to be making it more profitable for sequencers to outsource their blocks uh, to a competitive permissionless marketplace than it is to do these other two options uh, that are uh, potentially harmful or more centralizing uh, or less censorship resistant for the network. Um, and so the, the design goal is genuinely just like MEV boost to make it more profitable for the people who opt into the system than it is for those who don't. Um, and then the other inspiration here was that it was chosen to specifically let uh, proving marketplace designs uh, iter iterate and innovate outside of the scope of Aztec's governance. Um, there's going to be a huge amount of ways that proof generation, verification, aggregation, et cetera, can be optimized. Um, and we do think that leaving this out of the protocol lets you know you guys all actually explore all of these potential paths and kind of chart what is the most viable option. Um, at the end of the day, if someone comes up with a way to prove 10 times, 100 times uh, the size of an Aztec block, that's going to be more profitable for everyone. It's going to reduce users' transactions fees. It's going to be a, you know, a huge, huge boost for the ecosystem. Um, and so we really want to make sure that it's possible for uh, kind of the design space to be pursued or exhausted before everyone kind of just commits to the same model. Um, and yeah, so this is kind of, again, the recap here. Um, a lot of what we're talking about uh, and will focus on is this specific relationship here between uh, proving marketplaces and sequencers. Um, some of the changes that we talked about would actually, you know, and you collapse this proposal, prover commitment and deposit phases. Um, but this, this interaction here between whoever has block proposing rights and outsourcing the rights or outsourcing uh, proving it um, should be consistent in you know, all designs. Um, it's just a matter of how frequent uh, we have to do it. And if this actually needs to be an L1 interaction here between this uh, commitment address and, and deposit. Um, we propose some super, super basic APIs for doing this. Um, you can basically register for the system. Um, you can submit bids to the system, and you can submit blocks and all the associated data with the blocks. It's basically a one-to-one -one mapping of the Ethereum builder specifications. Um, I do think that there are a variety of changes probably needed, but in terms of like the actual API interface, it should be very consistent, um, uh, which is super nice for us. Um, and so there's a bunch of paths forward for prover boost. You know, regardless of what we talked about earlier and how we're making block block times go faster, we're very committed to a world where this exists, where it works, where it's well used. Uh, not just for Aztec, but for you know other potential options and other ecosystems, other rollups, applications as well. Um, and so there are you know a couple paths forward that we see here. Um, uh, one is facilitating an RFP for specification proposals. Um, on the previous slide, I basically put up you know three APIs. Um, it literally like your proposal could be as simple as those three APIs and just like specifying what is required for those three API endpoints. Um, this option could get the best design or quality of research, uh, which is interesting. Um, option two is like Aztec Labs defines the specifications. Um, we don't know if we're the best people to do this. Like we're not like auction experts. We're not like that ingrained into the L1 PBS landscape. Um, we could take a stab, but it would probably look like what I just put on the last slide. It'd be like, let's flesh out, you know, mapping of these existing API specs. Um, but this begs the question of like who builds it, right? If we define the specification, so then you'd still get back to this like question of you know ownership. Um, we could have like the people that are currently on this call kind of vote on who defines the specifications. Like if we think one of us is just best suited to do it, or uh, you know, we all agree that we should just go call flashbots or something like that. You know, we could uh, choose to do that. Um, it's not incredibly neutral, but it's definitely more neutral than us just deciding and being like, okay, this one person's going to define these specifications that could be you know, a critical component to the ecosystem. Um, and then I think option four is that we choose like a neutral third party contractor to define specifications. Um, Potentially the best option. It's probably the easiest option. It's just like you know, finding someone to do this that is not building a proving marketplace, not building a roll up, not like trying to sell any of us anything. I think. Um, and yeah, 
uh, I think, uh, yeah, Timu, we can uh, specifically set up this for discussion here. Um, we are willing to fund uh, this research, um, whether it's, you know, retroactive grants to RFP proposals uh, or to, you know, a specific entity that is uh, choosing to do so. Um, but yeah, what's up, Timu? Yeah, just <clears throat> quickly, like, I, I think the idea of building uh, something like Prover Boost is actually pretty exciting for some like neutral third party because everyone else is going to need the same thing as well. Uh, so in terms of some like dev shop wanting to position into this industry, it would make a lot of sense to do it at like pretty low cost, I would assume. Um, uh, and I think that would probably yield the best result because you do want someone who's like actively maintaining it as well and is like incentivized to maintain it, not just because somebody paid for it, uh, ideally. Um, and if one of us does this, it's always going to be like, okay, but we need to do this for a whole bunch of other things as well. And like, um, like ideally it's someone for whom being that kind of MEV boost builder is like, you know, core to their strategy over the long term. Yeah, that makes sense. Maybe an option um, would be like setting up a forum or like a Google or a, a poll to see if like the people on the call have a preferred preferred contracting shop or third party. Um, you know, I, I think most people are familiar with those who work in the industry. Um, there's not that many of them that are really good. Um, so yeah, maybe we could we could take a poll here, but um, I, I agree that this uh, option four here could potentially be the best um, in terms of like neutrality, long-term sustainability potentially, and uh, honestly, just like time and operational overhead from from our end. Um, so yeah, um, we'll keep it moving here because we are running out of time. Um, I do think that this is, yeah, Gevula. I think that if you want to go next, um, we have some slides at the end, but uh, we'll turn it over to you. Yes. I, I will go next. My kids are probably going to come home in about 10 minutes. So this is exactly the amount of time I need before all hell breaks loose. It's like, I um, yeah, let me just make sure that I can get it shared. Okay. Can you guys see that? All good. Good. Um, so I'm, I'm going to talk really high level about what we're doing. I know a lot of you know kind of what we're doing. Um, but um, just to get everyone onto the same uh, same page and then hopefully we'll have a little bit of time at the end um, to chat and dive into more specifics if, if we want to. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm Demo, um, one of the founders of, of Gavilot Domos, who's on the call is the other founder. We're building the ZK Cloud, as we call it, which is basically a universal proving infrastructure for for the ZK industry. Um, I'm going to run through these super quick because time is short. Um, but essentially, Gevulon offers kind of three things. Um, you know, proving verification and, and customization. And customization really means custom proof sets. Um, I'll kind of go through these in a weird order. But um, we, we offer verification because we need to do verification. Um, one sec, my kids are home, so I shall close the door. I don't know if I could attend this better for him. Okay. Um, so yeah, we need to do verification um, because we need to distribute rewards and we need to know who's done things correctly. Um, it's really not like a core external offering uh, as such. Um, we do kind of, uh, like if somebody wants to rely on uh, on Gebula verification, that's fine and we may provide some tooling for it but it's not structured to provide like the security guarantees for any specific uh, external use case. Um, and we have additional partners like Aligned Layer and Horizon and things like that, um, where you can kind of um, get different kinds of security guarantees that are more designed for, for example, a roll-up use case. Um, the main thing we're doing is, is proving. Uh, and so uh, you can deploy any prover. Uh, these are basically just OS images that you're, you're deploying. Um, they can utilize the CPU or the GPU, um, and you can offload your, your proving entirely to get it on. Um, and then the customization, uh, and I mentioned custom prover sets. Really what that is, is like when you deploy a prover, you can 
um, opt to define some uh, additional external software that prover nodes need to run in order to join the set for that specific prover program. Um, so you can imagine like you could enforce uh, prover nodes run like a DA node. Uh, you could enforce they run like a trusted execution environment, um, you know, an Ethereum full node, whatever, depending on your use case. Um, and this is relevant for Aztec because um, in order to do Aztec proving as a hardware operator on Gebulon, you're going to need to run an Aztec full node um, alongside the Gebulon node. But it also kind of gives you interesting new things to play around with. They're not quite sure what's going to make sense and what's not. But as an example, you could have like partially non-ZK based verification where, for example, the verifiers check whether you've broadcast something into some external network. Um, moving on. So just super quick, uh, sort of like how, what the interaction with, with Gavila looks like when you want to run a proving workload. There's way more info on our on our docs and in general on our current design iteration. It's all public on docs.gavila.com. Um, but once there's a prover that you've deployed or that someone else has deployed that you want to run, uh, you create a run transaction where you pass inputs into, or you, you sort of give the network the inputs that you want to run in that prover. Um, once that transaction is in a block, it gets allocated randomly to a prover in the global prover set. They generate the proof for you. Uh, and sorry, my kids have started yelling. Um, they uh, so it gets randomly allocated to a prover in the global prover set. That's just one prover. Um, they generate the proof for you, um, and then they kind of pass it back for verification. It gets verified by a subset of the prover nodes, and then ends up in a block, and rewards are distributed. Um, so that's just kind of like the basic flow, and then we build sort of execution guarantees, liveness guarantees, and fallback mechanisms around that structure. So we're really trying to minimize um, latency and, and cost first and foremost. Um, yeah, um, and so currently we have the Gebulot DevNet, which has been live since March 25th. Um, it's produced, I think, something like just under a million proofs, um, verified uh, around or done about 3 million verifications. Um, and it has all the functionality that you kind of will have in the final network, but in a permission sort of relatively non-scalable form. Uh, so you can deploy arbitrary provers, both CPU and GPU, run the workloads, track workload status, and it stores the proofs. Um, that's free for anyone who's, who's registered, and I'll quickly go through uh, registration in a sec. Um, if you want to check out kind of high level stats and stuff, um, these aren't up to date in the picture, but uh, you can head to dashboard.gevilot.com and you can also, if you're playing around with Gevilot, um, search for a transaction ID or a prover ID uh, and find it that way. Uh, so key registration, because it's permissioned and we don't have all the economics in, you need to register a key. You can do that with the Gevilot CLI. Um, and then coming to our roadmap, which is I'm sort of increasing the relevance to, to the Aztec conversation as we go. Um, so we have the DevNet. Um, what we're doing right now is we're, uh, in about a month's time, we're launching uh, Gebulot Firestarter, which is also a permissioned network, but it's basically made to be production ready. Um, so the idea is that the DevNet doesn't really scale to like hundreds of prover nodes. Um, we have proving demand for potentially thousands of pretty beefy machines. And so um, Gary Lot Firestarter is kind of our answer to that until we have mainnet around. Um, so that'll be launching soon. Um, and our selected partners um, will be able to deploy um, provers onto there. And for example, the Aztec stuff will probably start there as well. Um, and that will run essentially until mainnet is stable. Um, so what we've decided to do is not try to get everyone onto mainnet the moment we launch because we think it's quite like, or like it's such a mission critical thing. We're dealing with a lot of projects that are already live. Um, they need to, you know, generate those proofs for no matter what. Um, and so what we'll do is we'll run Firestarter until we get mainnet stable. So we're hoping to launch mainnet late this year and then, um, you know, whatever amount of time it takes to stabilize after that, and then we'll transition everyone over. 
So gave a lot of NAS tech. Um, Cooper uh, touched on these a little bit. Um, and I there's not a whole lot to say because I don't yet know exactly what Prover Boost is going to look like. Um, and of course, if the general design changes a little bit, that affects things as well. Um, our intention, and I would assume pretty much everyone's intention who's here, is to make it like a super low overhead, no thought required process for the sequencer or whoever is outsourcing the proving. Um, and so this was kind of our thinking here was like, okay, if if you have like a separate commitment um, that's done, the, the whole proposal commitment uh, process, um, I think the Prover Boost soft software should basically automate that within some parameters um, and then handle all communications with Gebulot or whatever other external uh, system it's, it's talking with. Um, so what we're going to be building once we know what Prover Boost will be um, is essentially an integration in addition to potentially like additional logic for handling the the, the whole process. Um, and our aim is to make that kind of optional, like give the user parameters uh, and things like that to, to, to change if they want, but also have it be sort of like a one click, don't need to worry about it experience. Um, and I think that's about it. So, um, I don't know how I did on time exactly, but um, I think you did great. Fairly succinct. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, no that was uh, a wonderful overview. Does anyone have any questions for Gebulot uh, while we're here? We have two or three minutes potentially. That is okay if there are no questions. Uh, I shall stop sharing. Yeah, no worries. Uh, if thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. Um, Marlon, we'll kick it over to you next if you want to share your screen. Maybe. Uh, yeah, I guess let's mute it to that. One second. Yeah, no, no worries. Uh, is it visible now? Yes, it is. Okay, perfect. All right, all right. Let's get started. So uh, I'm Roshan from Marlin, and like I'm here to talk about uh, Calypso. That's our uh, like circuit agnostic zk proof market uh, with like support for confidential mm -hmm. inputs. And uh, I thought I would also take the opportunity to uh, actually comment on the Funnet protocol from the perspective of a proof market, right? So. Uh, for context, uh, like as Cooper already introduced, uh, like ASTIC is a ZK develop where like sequences propose blocks which are to be proved uh, as like valid on an L1 for they're essentially considered final, right? So broadly speaking, uh, like for every slot, uh, as the first step, you have sequences that uh, use a verifiable random function to choose uh, like who will win the chance to produce the block, right? And then uh, like the winning sequencer essentially specifies who will be proving the block through Prover Boost. And uh, finally, you uh, have like the state updates along with the proof that are like submitted on L1 for like verification and like finalization. So for the purposes of uh, like this presentation, I'm interested in uh, mainly step two, that's like the proving step. Uh, like most specifically, uh, I'll be examining as to uh, like why outsourcing proof generation uh, like to a decentralized network of provers is like more beneficial as opposed to uh, like sequencers probably running prover hardware in house. And like whatever we'll also touch upon, uh, like how Calypso's architecture is like well suited for uh, ASIC's requirements. Right? So, uh, okay, let's start by uh, examining a few uh, like important requirements that uh, we think Fernet has of like a few proof market. Right. So the first requirement. Uh, is that Fernet wants proof generation to be really fast, right? Because it directly affects the throughput of uh, the ASTEC blockchain. And uh, while I believe Fernet is sort of sticking to a linear architecture for now, where the I mean, like a link between proving time and block time is like really obvious, uh, let's speak a bit into the future and examine where Fernet wants to be, right? So uh, Fernet is sort of envisioned like uh, CPU works today, which is like a pipeline architecture, right? So the various phases of the uh, block cycle essentially overlap with each other. And uh, as you can see in the image, um, 
So uh, the architecture also has to deal with the possibility of like pipeline stalls, right? Which can happen uh, during or like after proving uh, in case somebody, let's say, doesn't submit the proof or like the block doesn't get finalized or stuff like that. So the way you would uh, like recover from a stall is by uh, essentially throwing away a lot of the partial work that's been done for like any blocks that are still in flight in between, right? So uh, the proving time essentially determines the uh, depth of your pipeline, which is like a measure of uh, how many blocks can be in flight at a given time, right? So uh, lower the proving time, the less blocks that are going to be in flight and uh, the less work that you sort of have to throw away during the recovery process. So uh, Calypso can help here in two ways. The first is, of course, vertical optimization using like custom hardware. Uh, like Provers in Calypso operate custom hardware. That's like orders of magnitude faster and cheaper compared to just CP Provers, right? And uh, there's no real reason for sequences to sort of like provision such hardware, especially because they don't really have the biggest advantage that Provers in Calypso have, right? Which is that. Uh, they get to amortize the cost of like custom hardware over multiple markets, right? Rather than being attached to like a single protocol like Aztec. So the other way that uh, we can help is like horizontal optimization with like parallelization of uh, the entire proving process. We're sort of like breaking it down into smaller steps, right? So uh, let's say given a large subtree that you would want to prove, you can just like split it up into uh, like multiple smaller subtrees and like give them to different provers who can work, work on them like simultaneously. Like, so of course uh, you can't have perfect parallelization because of like data dependencies, like each level of the tree, as you can see, sort of depends on uh, like a proof that it's going to get from uh, a level that's like right below it, right? But uh, what you can do is you can sort of like reduce uh, like an O N time problem into something that looks more like an O log in time problem. And like the nice part about chunking the tree in this way is also that the uh, brewer size that you need is independent of the block size. So the market can really easily adapt to uh, like smaller and bigger blocks or like even full and like empty blocks really efficiently by uh, like just having less or like more brewers actually working on it, right? So this also makes it really easy for uh, like smaller brewers to exist alongside larger brewers and like make the system a lot more decentralized, right? So. As a bonus, uh, it's also more fault tolerant, as we'll see shortly. Um, so the second requirement that uh, we believe Fent has is that proof generation also has to be resilient, right? Uh, and it pretty much follows uh, like more or less the same reasoning uh, as for the first requirement of uh, speed. Uh, like Fernet wants to be pipelined and cares about stalls. This time we uh, essentially look at the frequency of stalls rather than like the recovery overhead, right? So. Uh, like a more resilient uh, proof generation process means that uh, like you would need to go through the recovery process uh, less frequently. And uh, like what I mean by resilience is essentially that the honest majorities in the system have uh, like ways to work around, let's say like malicious minorities uh, without resulting in stops, right? So uh, as like a simple example, uh, like simply selecting one single prover to prove a block is very risky, right? you essentially have a bus factor of one and uh, there's no real way for the other participants in the system to like prevent the prover from uh, causing a stall if he really wants to do so, right? So unsurprisingly, uh, like having multiple provers work on different parts of the same block as in the case of like parallelization is like really easy to recover from. Uh, the way Calypso handles this is by uh, having like a really efficient and fast uh, happy path while pairing that with a more expensive but robust like faulty path, right? So uh, I think this is not something uh, Fernet is unfamiliar with. It handles quite a lot of uh, like the errors in Fernet similarly as well by like essentially having proof races and such. So the benefits of like such a system is the uh, like low ongoing overhead that you're gonna have in the happy path that essentially lets you capture all of the upside while still having like a really robust uh, backup mechanism to capture the downside. So it sort of uh, gets you like the best of both worlds at like very little extra overhead, uh, like which is just one extra fee as you can see over here. So uh, and like you can also imagine that uh, maybe you can have more phases at you know different points and like the efficiency versus uh, robustness spectrum that you can add if you need. And like speaking of mechanisms, there's like a variety of design choices that you can make here as well. And uh, I'm guessing Prover Boost is going to be interested in all of that. 
Uh, so the most popular and like useful ones seem to be order books and auctions with like different strengths and weaknesses between the two. Uh, like order books basically provide uh, faster matching and like as we saw, uh, shorter proving times can give you high, higher throughput and asking, right? So in addition, uh, like the transparent nature of the order book uh, like gives sequences a real time price discovery as well as like a lot of visibility into uh, like the liquidity and depth of the order book at, like, at any given point of time, right? The uh, other popular option uh, is like auctions. Uh, they're useful if you need to adapt to like each order individually in terms of like pricing. Uh, it's also like able to adapt to batch orders in the sense that uh, you can basically sort of like set lower prices for like higher volume orders and stuff like that, right? So in general, uh, like order books tend to be good for you know, like standard compute that you want to get as fast as possible because then you're uh, orders are like essentially fungible and you get all the good properties of having like an order book exchange. Um, well, auctions essentially shine when the compute is sort of like high variance in terms of uh, like the time and money that it takes to generate a proof, right? So there are other mechanisms as well, including like proof races between all or like a subset of proofers, uh, like assignment using proof of stake, essentially like Aztec sequencers themselves. And of course, they all have that like their own trade-offs and there's no one size fits all. Uh, to the point where sometimes each circuit in a different protocol, uh, like let alone different protocols, like benefit from different mechanisms to handle them, right? So, which is why I think it's important to be as mechanism agnostic as possible. I believe Cooper had written a for forum post about the importance of this as well. Uh, like the main goal is to be able to uh, operate multiple mechanisms simultaneously without uh, splitting liquidity across like markets or mechanisms, right? And the way Calypso does it is essentially by structuring the market more or less like a compiler, where uh, the mechanisms uh, are the front ends that are sort of like creating these tasks from intents from the users, and the provers are the back ends that are serving the tasks, right? And the task book essentially sort of just sits in between, uh, like coordinating between the two camps. And like this basically lets you mix and match different mechanisms and provers, even for like different circuits within Aztec, for example. The base roll-up circuit might be a bit variable in terms of the proving time that you need, depending on the parameters and stuff like that. So you can sort of like feed that into the auction front end. Uh, while the merge roll-up circuit is like view more deterministic, so you can sort of like feed those into the order book. And like all of this is handled without the provers having to split their compute resources between one circuit or the other. So you still get all of the efficiencies and like liquidity and pricing. So the a uh, third requirement that Fernet has is economic security through like staking and slashing mechanisms. So uh, it expects the prover to deposit a stake that can be slashed if the prover does not provide a proof within a like let's say a given deadline, right? So the good news is uh, Calypso provides exactly that guarantee, except in a different token on a different chain, right? So uh, it's an interesting challenge to figure out how to bridge the two worlds together. Uh, the simplest option is, of course, the sequencer providing the prover stake himself and like keeping Calypso independent of the Aztec protocol. It has a nice property that you know while the sequencer is staking something, uh, he really does not have anything at stake in like a crypto economic sense. Like any slashing that might happen on Aztec is automatically hedged using Calypso, where uh, he sort of receives the prover stake to compensate for it, right? And it's really simple to make this happen in practice as well, because Calypso is like flexible enough to allow for it. Uh, like markets can just be created by anyone with custom parameters, like the minimum stake they want, uh, the slashing rates that they want, the deadlines that are in the jobs and stuff like that. So uh, like, it's really easy to align it uh, with like Aztec's own governance parameters to ensure like sequences are essentially neutral with respect to any slashing, right? And while that works, uh, it's not as efficient as we would like it to be uh, like mainly because of double lock capital. So there's a uh, stake logged in Calypso as well as Aztec, right? And like we have some ideas on how that can be improved, but obviously there's more work to be done on this. Uh, the main idea is for like stake to be used by either Aztec or more likely Calypso, accepting the other one's uh, representation of like stake token. And so that way stake in one protocol can just be reused in the other, uh, like which is way more capital efficient, right? Uh, like the stake would just flow between the protocols in like a just-in-time fashion and it would be way simpler of course if there was a common token that was accepted as uh, like stake collateral by both of the protocols 
Uh, okay, this is like still pretty early work, but yeah, I'm eager to see how this evolves. Just to round it off, uh, here's what the original model will look like with uh, like parallelized proof generation. You have a coordinator that's sort of like taking responsibility for the overall job. Uh, when a sequencer gets slashed, the coordinator essentially compensates the sequencer and all like is in turn compensated by the prover that uh, missed the proof, right? So this way, both the sequencer and the coordinator uh, like remain slashing neutral. So I also want to touch upon some tags that I've come across in the forum post as well as the uh, mitigations in Calypso. So uh, one is like the sequencer withholding data from provers, right? Uh, the way to mitigate this in Calypso is through the prover simply not accepting the job unless it is accessible somewhere. Like, so uh, this is automatically enforced by Calypso for all jobs anyway. So the same just applies to Aztec. And then there's the possibility of uh, the job having wrong inputs that result in proofs just being impossible to create, right? Uh, I assume Aztec is going to have its own slashing mechanisms to tackle this. Uh, but Calypso essentially features like a rejection mechanism that uh, allows the provers to basically prove the impossibility of a job and sort of just like reject them, right? Uh, like bribery or I guess more generally a low cost of attack is a problem. I, uh, you can sort of just set the market parameters high enough to mitigate this. Right? Like Astagato also seems to be taking like a similar route of economic security. Um, so the last one is like preventing centralization uh, within Calypso. So it's important to like enable provers with uh, low specifications to be able to participate in proving, right? And the parallelization mechanism that you described uh, essentially allows just that. And in addition, we're also looking at uh, something like restaking to like allow diversifying the prover set among like the validators and stuff like that. So to wrap it up, uh, I wanted to end with something that's a little outside the scope of Fenard, but uh, still quite relevant as a proof market. And uh, that's the ability to support private inputs through the use of TEs. Right? So uh, these are like hardware level isolated and uh, encrypted environments that isolated the applications, uh, like code and data from the kernel or like anybody with privileges pretty much. And it provides like really useful properties like computational integrity, uh, confidentiality, as well as like being performant in general that uh, essentially makes them a really good candidate for a proof market for like NOIA programs. So the uh, ideal users here would be like clients or wallets that are uh, looking to like outsource proving. It sort of like speeds up the proof generation process for them. And uh, it's especially important for uh, resource constrained environments, like let's say mobile phones, where uh, like, it's not as powerful and like battery life is an extra concern over there, right? So uh, it's like designed to protect private inputs and uh, we're currently researching like Pixie compatibility as well. So yeah, let's see where that goes. And yeah, that, that brings me to the end of the presentation. Uh, thank you guys for your time. And yeah, feel free to hit me up if you have any questions. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. It was uh, incredibly thorough and, and thoughtful. So yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for, for your time. Um, I acknowledge that we're over uh, on time, so I'm just going to kind of wrap it up here. Um, the next steps on our end is that we're going to continue debating the path to faster block times. Uh, as soon as we have a decision, we will share these on our research forum, including a big write-up on the trade-offs and kind of how we ended up at this decision. Um, we don't want to make this decision in isolation. So if you're interested in joining the debates or sitting in on a call, please feel free to let me know. Uh, it's a lot to get caught up on, and we probably won't slow down to bring you up to speed. But if you want to you know, try to catch up, we're, we're happy to have you uh, come along for the ride. Um, ask any questions async on the research forum or Telegram chat. Even if you have things that are like proactive in our roadmap or thinking about things that you know we haven't specified yet, feel free to just ask it publicly and we'll get to an answer eventually. And uh, if you're asking these questions, I'm sure other people are as well. Uh, we will have an ad hoc meeting whenever a decision is made on block production that impacts prover boost. Um, you know, we can talk about this more, but if other meetings are helpful, if people want to brainstorm more, we can have more meetings, we can have less meetings. It's kind of whatever people want. Uh, there will be a meeting approximately one month from now. We'll try to stick to a guaranteed monthly cadence um, in addition to ad hoc meetings if you know progress is made or otherwise. Uh, I'll set up a poll that will just vote on what the next date and time is in Telegram and contact Steve if you'd like to present on the next call. I do want to apologize to Wyatt uh, from NovaNet. Wyatt, if you're still on the call, do you want to introduce yourself really quickly? I kind of skipped him at the beginning when we were introing all the teams. No, no problem at all. Like it was the same timing my kids were coming 
back when leaving for school. So it was actually a good good timing not to make the call. I'm from Nelvanet. We're doing um, IVC based proving. Uh, it's actually NIVC based. We do it for top down and bottom up approaches. Uh, the bottom up is something like privacy for ZK gaming. Uh, but the top down are solving really big problems really quickly in a parallelized fashion. Uh, we're kind of a newer project. We're having a test net in August, uh, but I would like to. Uh, uh, we're actually diving into that as a part, part of the top down. Uh, but on the next one, I'll probably do a little bit more of an introduction. Uh, but thanks. Yeah, of course. Thank you so much. Sorry I uh, missed you earlier. Um, we'll probably hear more from Novanet on the call next uh, month. But yeah, if there's ever anything we can do for you in the meantime, please let us know. Don't be strangers. Uh, we'd love to help you. Um, with that being said, I will wrap up this call and thank you all so much for your time. Have a good thank rest. Thank you, Cooper. Yeah, thank, thank you as well. Bye-bye. Thank you. you. On the next call. Thanks, everybody.